Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful and beautiful Sabbath you've given us today. Father, thank you that we're so free to be able to come together to worship and praise your holy name. Bless everyone here today in your message. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 We'll now sing hymn number 334, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. church and welcome to worship we're grateful that our members are here faithful members to keep our church open and also to welcome our visitors we are thank God that he has given us this day that we can reflect on his goodness we can come together as a body and that we can praise the Lord together the scripture readings for this morning is a very simple one, but have well uh, packed. It's Isaiah 6, verse 1, and it says, you can follow. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. May the Lord add his blessing to this text of scripture. And may the Lord's glory fill this temple today. If we have any unspoken requests, please thank you and let us kneel where possible. <laughs> Father in heaven, O oh Lord, we are so happy to be in your house today. We are grateful, Lord, that you have entrusted us with your truth. We are grateful, Lord, that you have brought us to the truth. And as we've come this morning to reflect your goodness through songs and through prayers and through thoughts, we ask you, Lord, to accept them as coming from our hearts. We ask you, Lord, that you'd be with every congregation, whether they be under a roof or under a tree, wherever your people meet today, that your Holy Spirit will fill the, their breasts. Amen. And may the 
message that we individually need come from you today. We thank you, Lord, that we have in our midst today a young man who has, like Joshua, determined that he and his house will serve the Lord. Amen. And we thank you for the words that you have given him for us today. We thank you for his dedication. And we ask you, Lord, that as he speaks, you speak through him to us, that our hearts will find a place for your words and your Holy Spirit. Lord, in the time in which we live, we recognize that things are wrapping up fast. Signs around us tell us that it's not long before you will come. We ask you, Lord, to help us each one to keep our lamps trim and burning. We ask you, Lord, that we will stick to that which you have given us in your words and in the spirit of prophecy. We ask you, Lord, that this church at Wesley Chapel will not veer from the path for which it was established to be true to the truth by your help, that we will not follow or sway to the left or to the right, but we'll follow Christ Jesus all the way. Amen. Lord, we ask for your comfort for every family, those who are bereaved, those who are ill, those who are in special needs, for all the hands that have been raised, for the young, for the old. Father, we need you more today than ever. And for this Daniel seminar that you've put on our hearts to continue, we ask you to place on our hearts individuals who can come and listen and be benefited and drawn closer to you. And we ourselves, as we do our part, be drawn closer to you. Into your hands we commit all that shall come and all the services that shall follow. Bless us, Lord, and keep us to the end that when you come, we'll hail you as Lord and Master, Savior, Redeemer, and Friend. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. What a beautiful thing to see you sitting in our church today, that we can be here in God's presence. It's time for you to participate in our service today with our tithes and offerings. Uh, if you have, it's for the local church budget, and if you have anything else you want to give it to, please mark it on your envelope and don't write below the dotted line. As far as possible, the deacons please stand and let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, which art in heaven, we thank you that you have given us all that you have. We have blessed us tremendously. And as we return our tithes and offerings to you, may they benefit those that are sent to do. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. So good to see everyone today. Um, today's title of the message is, I don't know, I sound like, a, does it sound like a little bit of an echo? Yeah, okay. Um, the title for today is, In Difficult Times, God Does Not Abandon You. Let's have a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for hearing my prayer. Father, let this message be a blessing to everyone here today. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So today, I want to start off by reading Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Let's get a little bit of the context of what we're going to talk today. And it starts off by saying, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, I also saw the Lord, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. So two wings covered his face, two flew, and covered his feet. And it says here in verse 3, And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. In other words, I am ruined, I'm dead. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people with of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken the, from, with from the tongs of the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. In other words, removed to get rid of. Verse 8 Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, here I am, send me. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to develop just three thoughts out of the many that we can take out of this chapter. But the first thought is, and I want you to hear me out, it says, God never loses control of things or situations. I repeat, God never loses control of things or situations. Now, why do I say this? Because Isaiah starts off by saying that in Isaiah 6, that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the glory of God. It says here, the Lord sitting upon a throne in the year that King Uzziah died. So later you'll understand why I say this, that God never loses control of things and situation. And I will elaborate later, but one of the things that I want you to understand that King Uzziah, when he became king, how old was he, if you remember? He was 16 years old, and he reigned for 52 years. Now, mathematicians, if he started at 16 years of age, and you had 52 years of reign, how old was he when he died? 68, yes, absolutely. And do you know who his father was? King Amaziah. Now, he was a so-so king. He did some good things, but he also did some bad things. Now, the story of King Uzziah is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. And let's read verse 5. It says, and I want you to pay attention to this. It says here, and he sought God in the days of Zechariah. In other words, he persisted in seeking God, okay, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, who? King Uzziah, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Amen? So this is key. When King Uzziah became king at 16 years of age, he persisted in seeking God. That's a good thing. Because seeking the Lord one time is easy. When you're desperate, when your business has failed, when you have cancer, when things aren't going well, Seeking God, well, everybody seeks God, but persisting in seeking God despite the difficulties, despite the, any setbacks, 
Despite all the things that happen when you don't even understand, we're called to what? Persist in seeking God. Persist, persist, persist. There was a, I'm going to give you a story about a pastor and a senator. One time a certain pastor was uh, uh, called to a show along with a senator. And in the show, the senator asked the pastor a question because he had lost a son in a very adolescent teenage years. Um, the senator had bought a toy for his son, and long story short, uh, the boy killed himself because of this toy. Uh, so naturally, the senator is hurt. He's filled with pain, and he said, my teenager is dead. And then he asked himself, how can I follow God since God did this to me? Well, you can't just follow God when things are going well, right? The text says, in 2 Chronicles 26, 5, says, and he sought, who sought? King Uzziah. And he sought, in other words, he persisted in seeking God in the days of Zechariah. King Uzziah did. He persisted. So in other words, you must follow God in the good times and in the bad times. Maybe when you're employed or unemployed, when you're healthy or have cancer or have a problem. To follow Christ when everything is going well, that has no or much merit. But King Uzziah didn't follow the Lord when things were going well, but persisted in following him despite all of the difficulties but what difficulties could a boy face at 16 years of age? Well, they put him to govern at 16 years of age. I know what I was doing at 16 years, and it, I would have not been mature or capable probably or responsible enough to, I wanted to play sports, hang out with my friends. But King Uzziah was put to govern at 16 years of age. Now, the older leaders were probably like, talked among themselves and maybe said, what can this boy possibly know at 16 years of age? What will he teach us? What could he possibly, what possible wisdom could he have at 16 years of age? So he faced difficulties. The life of Uzziah wasn't easy. It was difficult. And even though he faced and confronted all these difficulties, he persisted, persisted, persisted in following God. Amen? So what were the results of him seeking the Lord and persisting? He says, the Holy Word of God says that as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper in everything. Amen? So the issue is that we want prosperity but not the persistence. Hmm. There is no prosperity without persistence. Things today don't come out of the way you want them to, then persist. Tomorrow, either the way you wanted it, persist. And the next, persist. And one day you'll find the prosperity that you long desired. But if at the first obstacle, you get discouraged and say, oh, well, Christianity doesn't work, then you're saying that the promises of God doesn't work. Right? Or am I wrong? Okay. No, my brothers, the Christian life is persistence, and Uzziah persisted. And that's why this story is in here. And the Lord prospered him. His fame grew even outside the limits of Judah and all around, and the enemies trembled. Now, one of the cool things that I read about Uzziah was that he did some extraordinary things. It says here that he opened cisterns, you know, tanks that water filled in, in the desert so that people wouldn't congest and congregate in the city. Now they can go on to the desert and have water at their disposition, and it says that 
He promoted agriculture, livestock in different ways, and he governed for 52 years, and in those 52 years, there was prosperity. Why? Because he persisted in seeking the Lord. Unfortunately, there's a but here in this story. Unfortunately, there was a misfortune here. Um, when he was filled with all this glory and with all this fame and prosperity that had already come to him from the Lord, the text says that he forgot the Lord and he started to trust in his riches, in his fame, in his army, and even in his own strength. And he believed that he was like God. Now, I'm probably going to tell you something that may scare you. <laughs> God knows to whom he will prosper. You hear that? If the prosperity will ruin you, out of love for you, He's not going to give it to you. God knows who he gives him money. But if money will ruin you, it's better that you enter poor in the kingdom of God than a millionaire or a billionaire and lose your soul here on earth. Out of love for you. And as much as you may desire money, God won't give it to you because in his infinite wisdom, he knows that the money will destroy you. It doesn't necessarily have to be money, right? Poor King Isaiah. He received money, riches, power, glory, but he forgot about God, the giver of all things. He believed that he was God. You know, only the priests were permitted by God to light up the altar, to burn sacrifices, and to work in the temple and turn on the altar. But one day, it occurred to the king, hey, priests, you are inferior to me. I am the king. I am worth more. I can do more. And if the priest can turn on the altar, then I, as king, can do much more. I am chosen by God, right? So he went to turn on the altar, and the moment he was turning the altar, the priest said, King, you are king, but you are not a priest. Here God said that only the priest can turn on the altar. You are going against divine orders. The king said, Who are you? In a rage, says in a word of God. In a rage. Do you think this process that the king changed from one way to another was an instantaneous thing? Guard your hearts. Guard your hearts against the enemy because he woos you away slowly and slowly, little by little. He won't shock you with it, quick things. So that you won't open your eyes and be like, wait, wait, wait. No, it's a slow process. You realize you start doing things that you didn't do before. And this and that. And your integrity starts getting compromised. And your love for God starts getting compromised. Look at, look at King Isaiah, 52 years. Who are you? Said the king. I do as I please. I am the one who gives the orders. And in that moment, something happened in the forehead of the king. A white spot, a little speck, a little blemish, a little stain, white stain, started growing in the forehead of the king. The king was leprous. And that little stain, the little blood, was starting to grow. And everyone came and covered the king and took him out of the temple right away. Sad thing is that he reigned with leprosy for many, many years. 
until he died. That year that King Uzziah died, the people were ashamed of his behavior, how impolite he had been, not only to God, but to the priests, and also how defiant he was to God. Instead of being grateful, he was defiant. The people were half disoriented, like perplexed. They were baffled because they trusted their king. He was a good king. When the enemies found out about the king being sick, they started to gather their armies to invade God's people. They just got a little wolf of weakness. And now they're ready to invade. And in those circumstances, those exact circumstances, when the people were perplexed, they were ashamed, the armies were gathered up ready to invade them, that's when Isaiah writes in chapter 6, and says, in the year that King Uzziah died, in other words, the year Uzziah was bringing shame to the people of God with his leprosy, in the years that the armies were ready to invade, in the year that the people were perplexed, Isaiah says, and I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. Amen? Now God is sitting on his throne. Why? Because, what was that? Because he is God, you said? Amen. Because everything is going well. What do you mean, Brother Uzmar, everything is going well? The king has leprosy. He is dying. The enemy's armies are preparing to invade, and the people are troubled. How is everything okay? That is what I want you to understand today, beloved. When in your life, everything is going south. When cancer attacks you, when your son is doing drugs, when you're full of debt, when you lost your job, when the ground is, when the ground under your feet is about to give out, instead of doing what the people were doing, they were crying, they were being ashamed, they were trembling, they were nervous at the enemies. Do as David did. Lift your eyes towards heaven and see that God is sitting in his throne. Amen? The earth may tremble, but God continues to sit in his throne. And from the heavens, he governs the destiny of the nations. From a man's point of view, you can think the problem has no solution, but God is sitting in his throne. If he's on his throne, then you don't have to be afraid or be filled with despair. Now, my question for you this morning is the following. Are you capable of sitting upon the throne? Or when problems arise, do you have eyes to see only your problems? So when problems come and you only fix your eyes on the problems of this life, you're lost. Even if the problems seem as though there are no solutions, you must dry your eyes and be capable to see God. Kneel before the Lord and tell him, Lord, I am hurt. My husband left. My wife has left. My son is imprisoned. I have cancer. I'm full of debt. I am lost, Lord. But I know you are there. And I know you will not fail me. In the middle of the hurt and pain, pray. Pray. Why have we lost that? Why have we stopped praying? God says, pray and fast. It's one thing we've forgotten to about also. Fasting. In the middle of difficulties, persist in prayer. When everything seems like the walls are caving in, keep praying. We worry about our physical health, but we forget about our spiritual health. 
your mind. Why pray? Because God is sitting in the throne controlling the destiny of the world, controlling every detail of your life. Every single little bit of detail. He knows everything. The following is the problem. So that you can see God when everything is going wrong and, or bad, you must have learned to see God when everything is going well. Did you capture that? So that you can see God when everything is going wrong. You must have learned to see God when everything is going well. You must see it. I remember one time I was recently married. My daughter was born several months later. We just bought a house. We pretty much spent everything almost that we had in buying our first home. And the first thing that went out was the heating system in Pennsylvania. And if you lived up north, you know how cold it gets in the winter. And it was an oil furnace. It was probably from like the 60s. Nobody would even touch it because it was so old and no HVAC company would want to touch it. They weren't allowed to touch it. So we had no money. My daughter was born. She got MRSA. She was in the hospital. Then as my wife was feeding my child, she gets MRSA. Now they're both in the hospital. I am alone. Heater breaks. Nobody wants to fix it. They want to replace it. They want like $10,000 for it. Seven to $10,000, depending on what all they had to do. And uh, it was Christmas time. And it was warm all this, the whole time, October, November, December. And that week that my daughter was born was the coldest week of the year. I mean, it, I believe it even snowed. It was freezing cold. And the heater broke. And I remember we were our Sabbath school lesson was about Job. In the good times or in the bad times, praise the Lord. And I remember that vividly. And I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I don't know how you're going to fix this problem because I have no idea how I'm going to, but I know that you're God. And I know you're going to come through because I believe in you. I believe in you. And this was all the time that I was coming back to the Lord, and I got on my knees, and I prayed, and I prayed, so I don't know how, but I know you're going to come through. I believe in you, and I trust in you. Just like Job, just like your son. And I know that before I was even prayer, because I found out later, God was already working. God found the person, the old owners of the house, called the friend, the new sister, I don't know, it was like a whole chain came back to us. The guy came in that Sunday. Now remember, this boil, this, this oil furnace heating system was from like the 60s, I was told. And he came on a Sunday. I thought he came to fix it. He said he just only came to look at it and to see it to tell me what was wrong for it. It was a Sunday night. I had no idea his wife was in the car. He was just going to go in and out. And I remember that he looked at it and he said, yep, yep, it's the oil burner. It's just charred. It's just, it's, been, it's just too old. It's burnt. You need to replace it. But you know what? I think I have one that I rebuilt and fixed in my van right now. And I said, my brother, whatever you need, whatever you want, just tell me how much if you can fix it tonight. And he, I told him the situation with my daughter, my wife, and everything. So he felt compassion, and he fixed it. He said, I think he said three or 350 bucks. He fixed it. Everything was running. Everything was working. And at the end, I said, so how much did you say was three, 350? He said, ah, it gave me like 250 bucks or something like that. It was less than what he said originally. 
And he fixed it for that price. God is good. God is good. And I can tell you stories of how I've seen the hand of God working in my life. If I would ever deny him or deny, I would deny everything that he's done for me. I would be a hypocrite. I can never deny my Lord. I can never do it because I know how wonderful he has been. Now that you have health, learn to see God. Learn to seek him. Follow him. Give your life to him. Now that you're employed and have money, now that you have children, learn to seek God. Unfortunately, human tendency is that when everything is going well, God, what for? What for? Another human tendency is that when things go wrong, that's when we remember God. So when things go well for you, you weren't able to see or you weren't capable to see God. How will you see him when the hurt and the pain arise, when death arise, when sickness or difficulties arrive? This message is to make you think. Look deep into your soul. See where you stand with God, your relationship with Him. Is He the Lord of your life? This is what the Holy Bible repeatedly says that today is the day of good news. 2 Corinthians 6 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Learn to see God today when you're healthy. Perhaps tomorrow you may be sick. And tomorrow, in the middle of your sickness, you will see God if today, in your health, you have learned to see him and make God the Lord of your life. Because Isaiah saw him sitting in his throne. Now the question is, who right now is sitting in the throne of your heart? Kien, who? Is it secular actors? Is it singers, sports people? Money, family, job? Who is actually sitting in the throne of your heart? Who presides in your life? A habit, a vice? Cigarettes, alcohol. Who is sitting at the throne of your heart? You know that in repetition, people remember a lot more. That's why I keep repeating. Who is the king? Who is sitting at the throne of your heart? If God is sitting on the throne when the pert when the pain and hurt and difficulties and trials and suffering comes, you will not tremble. You have peace. You're not going to cower. You're not going to be in despair or in anguish. Even if everything trembles around you, you will see Jesus. Psalm 91 says a thousand may fall and ten thousand may fall, but nothing will happen to you. He'll send his angels. There was a story about a little missing boy that I want to relate to you. Um, There's a story about a, a pastor that went overseas to a country that he didn't really speak the language very well. So obviously there was a language barrier there. And the family was shopping in the town square, you know, and, Countries like in Colombia, there's like a little town square center we call it, and everybody, it's like little kiosk everywhere, and people go shopping. You can get everything. Call it like a fresh market and things, but they sell everything. And uh, 
As they were shopping, the five-year-old got lost in the middle of the multitude of people. And they desperately searched for this boy, and they couldn't find the boy. The family was crying. They were desperate, and they had no success finding the boy. And they got the authorities involved, and the authorities said, you know what? Um, I think we should wait till about 6 p.m. That's when it starts getting decongested and the people start going home and the, and the store starts closing. So they saw that it was futile to keep looking and searching because it was just so many people. This city had three million people, more than that. So they had no choice. They accepted and they waited till about 6 p.m. And lo and behold, as, as 6 o'clock came around, stores started closing. People started leaving, and less and less people were there. They were able to see more around. And it says here that a minutes later, they found the boy. He was sitting on top of a fruit box, playing with something like marbles. And he was just calm, peace, serene, playing, having a good time by himself. And the father runs up to him thinking that he would be crying, he would be scared. And desperate, but it was the complete opposite. So the father hugs him, and so did the family. And the father looks at his wife very surprised because he was so calm. And when they get home, the father asks the boy, Why aren't you scared at all? You were lost, son. No, I wasn't. I wasn't lost, said the son. I was waiting for you. Aren't you my father? Weren't you going to look for me? Hmm. Now it puts that in perspective with us. We shouldn't worry. Our Father's always seeking us. Oh, beloved, in this life, when the cold winds of difficulty start to blow in your life, when all the doors close at you and everyone abandons you and you get the impression that you are alone, you are never alone. Nunca. You're only waiting because your Father is coming. Or is He not? He is sitting at the throne of your heart? Then don't be afraid. He will appear in the opportune time. When, even when you think that everything is lost, he will appear. This is why in Isaiah chapter 6, 1, in the year that the king Uzziah died, and the people were desperate, they were full of shame because of the leprous king, the enemy was preparing to invade, Isaiah says, and I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. Do you know what happens when you see God in His holiness and His glory? You understand your sinfulness. Sometimes I find someone who believes that he or she is too holy, a saint, believes that they're too good and perfect. Sometimes I find someone that not only considers themselves holy, but also believes that they have the right to point their fingers of the sins of each and every one around. You know why that is? Because if you've never seen God in His glory, because if you would see Him and His glory, you would never feel that you would be in the right to point the sins of anyone, especially being a sinner yourself. You will fall like Isaiah fell, recognizing your afflictions, your sinfulness, and you will say like Isaiah said, I am undone. In other words, I am ruined. I am dead. Because I have seen God and His holiness. I am that man with unclean lips that live in the midst of people with unclean lips. I have seen God, so I am undone. If today I'm preaching to someone who feels unclean, dirty, and distant from God, I have good news for you today. 
I have a gospel. We have a gospel. The good news that Jesus came and he truly died for you. Even though you're unclean spiritually and you feel unworthy, Jesus died for the unclean and those unworthy people. Or isn't that the reason why you're here today? Because of that hope that we have. If, someone, if I have someone here today that feels that they are saved because they keep the Ten Commandments, because they eat this and not that, I have sad news for you. Jesus has nothing to do in your life. You don't need Jesus, right? He came to this world to heal the sick. The healthy have no need of God. When you recognize your sinfulness, it is not for you to continue wallowing, in other words, rolling in the filthy pool of sin. Acknowledging your sinfulness is only the first step in the restoration of your life. When Isaiah recognized his sinfulness, what happened? What happened? The text says that an angel came and having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongues from, the, from off the altar and laid it upon his mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. In other words, removed. Get rid of. Isaiah had said, My lips were unclean. And after the cold, the angel said, They're no longer unclean, because your sins have been forgiven by God. Your guilt has disappeared. You are now saved for the kingdom of God. I have people tell me, well, I don't feel forgiven. Well, you don't have to feel forgiven. God promises that if you have sinned, we have a lawyer and an advocate, right? In heaven, Christ the just, who will forgive us. Believe that he'll forgive and you'll be forgiven. Repent. In other words, turn from your wicked ways and he will forgive you, truly. In the altar, in the temple. What happened there? What happened in the altar and in the temple? What did the priest do every day at the altar? He offered sacrifices. Who died in the altar? A lamb. And who did that lamb symbolize? Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What does God want to tell you today? That salvation comes from the altar. Your salvation comes from the Lamb. Your salvation comes from His spilled blood. Your salvation is by grace. Amen? Your salvation comes from Jesus. Paul says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But by that doesn't mean that we're all condemned. Paul also says in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen? One day, one day Jesus was lifted up on the cross at Calvary. He suffered what we had to suffer for our sins. Cried that for which we had to cry. He suffered for our attitudes, our comportment, our behavior. He was humiliated as we should have been humiliated because of our foolish decisions in our life that we make day and day. He died the death that we deserve, but for what? For what? To give you life and a second chance. Why? <laughs> Simply because he loves you. He truly loves you. You can look at any other religion and there is no God that has disposed himself of his royal robes of his throne and turned himself 
incarnated into flesh and died for you and me. You won't find it anywhere. That took upon everything on his shoulders and died for you and I. That's a love that we will never understand. Don't ask me why God loves you. He doesn't love you because you're good. He doesn't love you because you did something worthwhile. But he also doesn't stop loving you because you're bad. Now, understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying go do. I'm saying he loves you immensely. Let yourself be drawn to Christ. Go to him. Surrender to him. Give your life to him. What's holding you back? Salvation is free. Jesus already paid the price. That's why it's free to us. Stop thinking that you can do this on your own. You can pretend, you can give the impression that you're good knowing that you're not. Jesus is the only way out. Today is the day of good news. Today is the day of salvation. Do you want it? Are you seeking it? Are you persevering? Are you being persistent in seeking God? Or only on Sabbath at 10 a.m. to 12, 12.30. Let him wipe away your past. Let him make you new again. That is my desire for you today. May God bless you. Amen. Amen. The closing hymn is hymn number 337.
Thank you, Father, because we're redeemed. Father, now that we go our ways, thank you for the spiritual food that you have given us, Father. Thank you for the message that you put in my mind and our hearts. And Father, bless us as we go. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated.